After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in the vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring. And a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. When birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, your, excuse me, as for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down, and it was dark. Behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and pray that your spirit would bless it to our hearts, encourage us, comfort us, uh, assure us of your uh, great love and your great work on our behalf. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I think Abram had reason to be afraid. When you are successful in battle and you put foreign armies to fight, you have to know that people notice. The enemy themselves might decide that they need to come back with fresh troops and attack again. And so you are exposed to the wrath of the king of Elam, which was a great power at the time of Abraham around the year 2000 BC. And incidentally, in history, Elam was a great uh, world power of that time. So Ketelopomer, an Elamite, was the head of this empire and defeating his armies, which may not have been especially large armies uh, to begin with, but after going through battle after battle after battle and finally working their way back, they were depleted. And then Abram took a, a, a 
gathering of his own men and servants and others with whom he was allied and attacked them uh, and rescued his nephew Lot. Abram had to be concerned that they might want to wreak vengeance on him. What is more, Abram might now be looked upon differently by his friends and neighbors in the community. They might look on him now as more of a threat. We never realize that this man who tends his sheep is such a brilliant, fearless warrior who is able to <laughs> throw off the Elamites. And so there could have been a tremendous amount of concern about Abram and uh, what he was going to do next. Is power going to go to his head? Will he want to conquer us as well? And so Moses begins this text here in the 15th chapter by saying that after these things happened, uh, including this most recent event where he rescued his nephew Lot, Abram may have been very uh, well concerned about his safety and well-being at that moment in time. And it's in, in that moment, that psychological moment, when he is fearful, where he is perhaps anxious, nervous, looking about, wondering where he might be attacked, what else could go wrong at this point, at that very moment, God comes to him. And it, it, it's rather interesting the way Moses puts this before us. God, the word of the Lord comes to Abram. That's the language of uh, what the prophets would use. Remember the prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah would talk about the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he said, thus says the Lord, or something to that effect. Here, we have the first time when this phrase occurs, and it marks Abraham out as a prophet of God. This will occur, uh, be noticed by God himself later on in, I think it's the 20th chapter, where he's with the king of Abimelech. And God tells him uh, that Abram is a prophet and he will pray for you and you will be healed of the, of the diseases that uh, had affected him at that time. The word of the Lord came to Abram. And when we think about the word of God, we think about that which is auditory, that which we hear. God speaks. We listen to what he has to say. This is the word from God. But it comes to him in the form of a vision. And as I thought about that, I was curious about that. We, you have God come to Abram, appealing to his senses. What is it that he can see? What is it that he hears? Uh, God is going to make very, very sure that Abraham listens to him and understands what he has to say. And he's, if you will, bringing a multimedia approach to Abram through word and vision form. It's a reminder that Jesus himself is the word of God. The Gospel of John opens by saying that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He's also the very image of God. Uh, Paul makes use of that language on multiple occasions, and then the writer to the Hebrews describes him as the image and likeness of God. The exact image and representation of God. And so if you wish to see God, you see him in Jesus. God comes and speaks to his servant Abram, this word of encouragement and hope. God says to Abram, at this moment in time, I am your reward. Abram just uh, let the king of Sodom go with all the property, all that uh, was Abram's proper booty from his warfare. Abram had won all that in battle. It didn't belong to the king of Sodom. <laughs> he comes up and says, Abram, just give me the people and you can have the property. Well, that's fine, but the king of Sodom was not in control at that point. But he was rather arrogant in thinking that that was the case. Abram declined to accept anything from the king of Sodom, lest he be enriched by him in any way. But now God says to him, you have something greater. Greater than property. Greater than people. I am your shield. I am the one who will protect you. 
And so Abram could be confident in that. The, the next phrase there, as he goes on to say, is I am your shield. And some translations, the NIV and the King James Version, say that God is, I am your shield and your very great reward. Uh, the English Standard Version says, and your reward will be very great. A little difference in nuance there. Uh, I understand, I think, what the English Standard is trying to say in translating it as, uh, your, war, your reward will be very great. Because after all, what is it that uh, God talks to Abraham about here, but the fact that he will have a, a, a family, a descendants that will be as uh, multiplied as the stars in the sky. And Abraham will possess all of that land that he can see. And so there's a great reward here laid up for Abram, which God's going to reveal to him to be an encouragement to him. And so I think that there's nuance there and a reason to say, your reward will be very great. I am your shield. You have not lost anything when you gave up all this goods and, and from, from the, your battle here. You have something far better. I will take care of you. It's a great comfort for the people of God to trust in God's provision for them and to know that what they have in God is far greater than what they could have from this world. Jesus, you remember, uh, said, what does it profit of man if he gains the whole world and yet loses his soul? It's to that end that, uh, well, I... I would probably technically agree with the English Standard Version in this translation here. I, I do love the NIV and the King James Version here, which says that I am your very great reward. I am your shield and your very great reward. For after all, when we think about the seed that Abraham was uh, going to be blessed with, ultimately that leads to the Christ. And so the great reward for Abraham was the Christ who was yet to come. It was in the Christ who was coming that Abraham would have his salvation. It was in the Christ who was to come that Abraham would be reconciled to God fully and completely and have communion with God. And so when we look at the extension of the family and the possession of the, uh, of the land and, and marvelous as those things are, Scriptures always point us above these things, beyond these things, to God Himself. What is your very great reward in this life? What is it that you take the most satisfaction in? There are many things that occupy us. Automobiles, football games, concerts, all kinds of things might occupy our minds. But really, we should wish to know God and see in Him our great reward. And so God comforts Abram in this way. He lifts him above earthly things to see himself. And so Abram receives this vision from God. He accepts God's word, but he has a problem here. And the problem is, that God has made certain promises to Abraham, these here, but also more specifically about a son who is yet to come, a child and a large family. And that promise was made quite some time ago when God promised him, get up, leave Ur of the Chaldeans and go to the land that I will show you and I will make you and your descendants great in that land. God had a promise and then Abraham got up he went across the Fertile Crescent, up towards Haran to the north, and then came down through Palestine, traveled through there, saw different things, saw different people. A famine comes to the land, goes down to Egypt, gets into trouble in Egypt, comes back up into the land of Canaan. His nephew gets captured in war. He goes off to battle. He comes back from battle. All of this is happening since the time God promised him possession of the land and a child. But he's still childless. And he's really a vagabond in the land. He does not own a bit of property there. And 
so Abram lives with a tension between the promise of God on the one hand and the providence of God, the fulfillment of the promise. God says, I'll give you a child. Abraham waits and waits and waits. Nothing happens. He's getting older. His wife is getting older. And it all seems to be in jeopardy. And so Abram has this very existential question. What are you going to do for me? When are you going to act? Do we not find ourselves in that place from time to time where we have the promises of God and yet we are faced with crises in life, we are faced with troubles in life, problems in life, we're wondering, where's God? Why isn't he answering me? I need a job, I need my health restored, I need uh, a, a, a relationship restored. All kinds of things come to our minds and we remember the promise, ask and it shall be given to you, seek and you shall find, knock and the door shall be opened unto you and we've asked we pleaded, we begged, but bad things still happened. And you're wondering, where is the promise of God? We'll see here that God is faithful and true to his promises, that he will bring about into Abram's life what he had promised. Um, but we will also see that sometimes God answers things in ways that we don't expect, above and beyond what we would imagine. In, in, in ways that we could not even imagine. But we live in this time of tension at special points especially. We we're wondering, where is God right now? He's always there. He is your reward. He is your shield. And you need to trust Him in this period of testing. So, Abram raises this question, and you wonder, well, isn't this rather uh, intemperate of Abram to raise this question before God? How could he question God? Uh, why would he raise this? God wants us to bring our questions and concerns to him. He does not rebuke Abram for bringing his request. Uh, he welcomes it, and then God responds to it. It's important for your spiritual life that when you have questions and doubts that you look for the answers. And seek God's face. Raise your questions. Go to Him in prayer. Go to the Scriptures and seek. Try to understand what is it that God is actually saying in His Word. And how does that guide me in terms of what I need to do in my life? And so, don't be afraid to ask questions of God. To explore His Word in the fellowship of the saints, perhaps with pastor, with somebody who's uh, a godly person, but seek the answers. They are there. And God comes to Abraham, then I keep going back and forth between Abram and Abraham. <laughs> but God comes to Abram and says to him, uh, let, let's take a walk outside. And he shows him all the stars up in the heavens. I did a little bit of reading. I did a Google search. And I asked, dear Google, <laughs> you better make sure nobody respond. Hello, Siri or anything like that. <laughs> I, I did a search as to how many stars are there in the universe. There's a lot. In the Milky Way, our galaxy, there are 10 to the 11th or 12th power Stars. That is the number 10 followed by 11 or 12 zeros. Like a billion, billion, trillion stars just in our galaxy. And this is not the only galaxy in the universe. There are as many as that same number, 10 to the 11th or 12th power, at least by some estimates, by the Euro Space Academy or what have you, uh, that there are 10 to the 11th or 12th power numbers of galaxies up in the heavens. And so you've got the Hubble telescope and other telescopes looking up and they see more and more and more galaxies. If you take a moment to get out of this area, go up to Vermont or someplace where there are no street lights and take a look up at the heavens, you'll be amazed at what you see. And then if you can take a telescope and you just point it out to a, a spot in the sky, you might be amazed that you'll see so much more. 
when I was a boy, my parents got me a telescope and I would go out at night and take a look and about the only thing I could see was the moon, you know. <laughs> but I would take a look at that and say, wow, that's pretty amazing. But I don't see a man there with green cheese or anything. Um, but God invited Abraham to go and take a look at the heavens. And he said, so shall your descendants be. It's not that there's an exact count of stars up for the number of descendants, but it's a likeness. Can you count all these? Well, you can't count how many children I'm going to give you. You will be amazed, Abraham. Now, when we go through Abraham's family, we see that it's not Ishmael that's God's chosen. It's Isaac. And then with Isaac, it's not Esau. It's Jacob. And with Jacob, he has 12 sons, but some of them are not very godly, to say the least. And so God has an election within the elect, a people within the broader people. But it's a, a promise that goes not only to Israel, but to the nations as well, and includes all the nations of the earth. We, who believe in Christ, are all children of Abraham. We are part of those stars of the galaxies that Abraham was directed to. A vast number that will eventually gather in that heavenly city to praise and glorify God. And so God points into the heavens. And as Abraham sees this and hears the word of God speak to him this way, he responds with faith. Moses says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, that statement could be a whole series of sermons, at least a whole other sermon here. But with Abraham, when he believed the Lord, he believed the promise of God. He believed the truthfulness of the word of God. He knew that what God said was true and that God would, in fact, carry it out. That was his faith. He trusted in God. And God credited it credited this faith as righteousness. Now, that's the thing where we get a little bit confused with as to what that means. Let me say what it doesn't mean, first of all. It doesn't mean, to begin with, that Abraham's faith was accepted by God as itself a righteous act. There's the idea among some that God gave the law to Moses, the Ten Commandments, and people failed to keep that law, and so in view of that failure, God had provided an alternative Okay, if you can't keep the commandments perfectly, here's one thing you can do. You can believe. And I'll reward that faith with righteousness. Now, faith is not a work that we perform that merits anything from God. Our faith itself is a gift of God, a gift of God's grace. And it is the means by which God communicates to us an alien righteousness, a righteousness that is not ours. It's a righteousness that is imputed to us or credited to our account through faith. Now, it wasn't Abraham being the righteous person that God was saying, okay, I take a look at your life and you're a godly man. I accept you as righteous. Abraham did, did many things, but it wasn't these things that Abraham did which credited him as righteousness. No, it was his faith. And God brought righteousness to him through that faith. Now, the Apostle Paul explains this in Romans chapter 4 and also in Galatians chapter 3. I think it's in Galatians chapter 3 where he says, that, How did you receive the Spirit of God in your midst? Was it by performing works and various miracles or by hearing the word with faith? And there he juxtaposes or, 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 or makes a big separation between our works, those things which we do, and the exercise of faith. Faith, then, is not a work that we perform. It's a gift that God gives to us. And with that gift, God gives us the righteousness of Christ. It's his righteousness that is imputed to us. It's not our righteousness it gives us a right standing before God. Not our good works, not our performance, not even the exercise of faith earns, merits, eternal life. No, the righteousness of Christ is communicated to us and received by faith, by faith alone. Now, there's much more to consider in this chapter, and I see that our time has rapidly declined, so I think I'm going to finish up here uh, this morning. 
and uh, wrap this up a little bit here. Uh, today, it's very important that we understand where, uh, what is the basis of our relationship with God. Is it on the basis of our works righteousness? If you go in the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church, your works are part of what contributes to your salvation. They are what merits favor from God. As you perform these works, uh, you're, you gain an acceptance before God. And so it's either through your sufferings, which eventually lead to purgatory, and you suffer in purgatory for an extended period of time, and then you're released from that when you have finished suffering and have been purged. And also your works in different ways can merit life from God. And so in the Roman Catholic system, your works are meritorious, they receive favor from God, and indeed they may be of such character, what they describe as super erogatory works, whereby they may be deposited in what's called a treasure of merit, that you can apply to through indulgencies, whereby that merit of the saints can be used to other reduce the penalties and punishments that you experience in this life or uh, relieve those who are suffering in purgatory for a period of time through the use of the indulgence. And so the indulgence makes use of that treasury of merit and allows the saint in purgatory to be released. <coughs> you see, the Roman church recognizes that there are good works that are necessary for you to do to merit earn your salvation. Christ works for you, but you also have to work. That is not the gospel. That is not a sure foundation for your relationship with God. Why? Because your works are always corrupted and polluted by your sin. <coughs> However, good you may try to make yourself be, you're always aware that your motivations are corrupted. You have wrong motivations here. You might not conform exactly to God's standard there. In some form or fashion, you miss the high mark of perfection that God requires of us. And because you can never rise to that mark of perfection, you never do any works, not one, not one that are of sufficient value to merit favor from God. Isaiah said to the folks in his day, all of your righteousness is what? As a filthy rag. I said that one day to a man in Neptune, New Jersey. I was a young guy at the time, knocking on doors. And he was a police officer. He had rescued people uh, from the bay that there in, in the shore in a race, he gave up his own race and rescued some, he was telling us all about this. And I said to him, well, you know, your righteousness before God is a, is a filthy rag. <laughs> a little bit impertinent. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, I'm about to punch you in the mouth. <laughs> he was a big guy, if he would have hit me, I would have been in trouble. But anyway, this is God's evaluation of our works. They never arise to perfection, and so therefore, if you're depending on Christ and your good works. The weak link is your good works. And you will never, ever be able to suffer for your sin sufficiently or perform a work that merits God's favor. And so therefore you have a weak link and you will fall. It's inescapable. You will perish. In the Roman system, Christ does not actually save you. In the end, you save yourself. Christ provides an opportunity, sets it all up for you, gives you the grace, uh, infuses you with grace, helps you do many things, but in the end, if you don't have merit, you must perish. And you cannot have merit because sin is so much a part of us. Trust in Christ and in Him alone his death alone is sufficient to pay the full penalty for your sins. His righteousness alone is sufficient to give you a right standing before God. 
No sufferings that you do can atone for your sin. No good works that you perform, feeding the poor, caring for the needy, whatever. None of that is sufficient. You will perish if you're depending on that. You must rest on Christ. God's provision of salvation in Christ. As Abraham did. Abraham the believer. He believed God and God credited him as righteousness. He reckoned it to him. He declared him righteous. And one, one last thing. Notice, Abraham had been acting in faith for quite some time, right? He left Ur of the Chaldeans. He came to the land of Canaan. He trusted in God that going into battle. He comes back and gets, he meets with Melchizedek. He's blessed by Melchizedek. Uh, he's acting in faith. But here God says in the 15th chapter, Abraham believed God and was credited to him as righteousness. Is this where he becomes a Christian, if you will? Is, is this where he becomes a true believer? That was something I was struggling to figure out. And Calvin uh, has a great explanation for that. He noted the fact that this is not where Abraham first becomes a believer. Rather, what we have here is that at every point in life, we are justified before God, we are righteous before God solely by faith. So that Abraham, when he left early Chaldeans, believed God's word, believed God's promise, he was righteous in God's sight. It was not because of his works that he was righteous, it was just because he believed and God credited him with righteousness. And through his life, at every point along the way, it wasn't because of what he had done, it was simply because he believed God's promise. And God credited it to him as righteousness. And so we never depend on our good works to get us into glory. We always depend on the righteousness of God imputed to us through faith. Faith being the agency, the means, as it were, the hands that receive the gift of righteousness. Faith is not the righteousness itself. It is that which receives the righteousness of Christ. It's only in that way saved. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word and we thank you for uh, this example in the life of Abraham where he trusted in your word. And we pray that you would help us ever more to trust you. And when we have questions and doubts and uh, don't understand things, we thank you that you are a God who assures us of your commitments and your purposes, your purpose of grace. Help us to receive that assurance and to be filled with joy and peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.